recently, but yeah, McKinley McKinley was the last one uh, who okay. had served in the Union Army, and he he was last elected in 1900. But yeah, for a long time, it was like you had to have that on your resume. You, even even Democrats were occasionally running former Union generals. Right. So this goes on for a long time. And you can find footage from the 1930s of Franklin Roosevelt speaking to Confederate or uh, Confederate um, Civil War veterans. And if you want to hear what a rebel yell sounds like, I looked this up recently when James described it as a banshee call. You can find footage of octogenarian, nonagenarian Confederate veterans gathering together to do a yell rebel yell. So if you want to hear it, there it is. Um, anyway, so back to Sherman. Uh, he dies in 1891 at the age of 71. <laughs> Interestingly enough, he got along poorly with his foe, Joseph Johnston, but one of the honorary pallbearers at his funeral was Joseph Johnson. So there you go. Some reconciliation at the very end. Well, they were friends for years afterward, actually. They they exchanged letters, and even during the war, they had a lot of respect for each other. I, I want to jump in and just add something. I can't resist that that those famous lines of Sherman: "If if nominated, I will not run. If elected, I will not serve." Those were quoted so many times, or at least alluded to by future candidates, because we have an interesting. You know this, Scott. We have an interesting tradition in our yeah. presidential elections. It's kind of gone now, but but even as late as Ronald Reagan, uh, one of the times he ran. You're when you when you're running for president, you're not supposed to want it, right? You know, you're you're supposed to your attitude because you don't want to be seen as too ambitious and too greedy for power. So for years, I mean, beginning with George Washington and, and almost every election for most of our history, people they'll be asked, "Well, are you running for president?" Well, you know, if the people want me, uh, I don't really want this, but uh, but I'm open to the possibility, and and, and I'll do what the people say, and. And, and and I was I've been listening to a biography by Ronald Reagan and he at one point said something like, well, I'm not. Gonna, they asked him, are you going to run? Uh, and he said, well, I'm not going to do the Sherman thing and, <laughs> and say, say, you know, I will not run. So so people use that as something to react against. I, yeah. OK, so I'm not like dying to be president, but I'm also not I'm open to it. I'm not going to do what Sherman did. So Sherman becomes the standard against which candidates measure their ambition. And I think that's pretty funny. All right. Well, shall we go on to Joseph yeah, Johnson? Speaking of Johnson. Sherman's two-time opponent in the Civil War, we, they, they faced off outside of Atlanta, and then later the, toward the very end of the war, they faced off in North Carolina. And they were good friends. Uh, like many of his colleagues, Johnston, after the war, worked in the railroad and insurance industries. And like them, he wrote his memoirs, and he served in the U.S. Congress for one term. Very interesting, just two years, 1879 to 1881. And also, like a lot of these former generals and former officers of, of any rank, he was active in veterans associations. Johnston remained highly respectful of his old opponent, Sherman, and he would not allow criticism of Sherman in his presence. How about that? That's pretty impressive because there was a lot of criticism of Sherman in the South for many, many years afterward. Sherman and Johnston corresponded frequently, and they met for friendly dinners in Washington whenever Johnston traveled there. When Sherman died, as you mentioned, Johnston served as an honorary pallbearer at his funeral. During the procession in New York City, on February 19, 1891, Johnston kept off his hat as a sign of respect, although the weather was cold and rainy. Someone concerned for his health asked him to put on his hat, to which Johnston replied, if I were in his place and he were standing here in mine, he would not put on his hat. <laughs> and he caught a cold that day, which developed into pneumonia. And he died a few weeks later in 1891 at the age of 84. So for the third time, Sherman defeated him. <laughs> Even in death, he's, yeah. he's dead, and he still defeats Johnston. Hey, everyone. Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. His words came true, but it's it's really hard not to get swept up in the romance of that period when you do have chivalry on both sides. Mm -hmm. um, and... Yeah, it like you said with the with these statues being taken down, 
understanding today with the legacy of slavery and the the legacy of race relations in America, it's something that America is reckoning with. But still, I mean, on both sides, the chivalry that you do see, it's it's hard not to get admire to admire it. So, all right, moving down the chain of command, next is Philip Sheridan. So after the war, he also stayed in the army, serving in Texas during Reconstruction. He famously said, "If I owed Texas in hell." I would rent Texas and live in hell, (laughs) which based on temperatures there, um, speaking, I'm not sure in the temperate sense or in um, the, uh, the cultural sense, but uh, anyway, uh, the temper this summer has been, (laughs) (laughs) you can understand his words. Yeah. Uh, So after his death, one Texan replied that his body should be reinterred in Texas so that he could be in both at the same time. (laughs) (laughs) I love that quote. So Sheridan later commanded U.S. Army troops that fought against Indians in the West. Uh, He was an observer in the Franco-Prussian War in the 1870s, and he coordinated relief efforts uh, after the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. After uh, Sherman's retirement, Sheridan became general-in-chief of the U.S. Army, and he served in that capacity until his death in 1888 at the age of 57. All right, and who is the Confederate counterpart? Sure. Well, let's talk about good old General Beauregard, one of the Forrest Gumps of the Civil War. <laughs> it's like, it doesn't matter where we are, west, east, deep south, on the coast, he pops up. Uh, so Beauregard, originally from Louisiana, of course. After the war, he served as a railroad executive. That kind of seems to be the go-to thing, especially if you're a southern officer. And then he managed the Louisiana State Lottery, and he became very wealthy in the process. He and Jubal Early. We'll talk about General Early, of course, later. But, um, yeah, they, they basically were paid huge sums of money to pull numbers out of a bin. <laughs> That's not bad. Yeah, it's good work if you can get it. I, I may see if, see if there's any listings for that. <laughs> After being After uh, uh, supported by a wealthy widow. Yeah, I think the widow would be even better. Then you don't have to do anything except write a book. But – Beauregard and Davis um, published – this is Jefferson Davis, of course, speaking of him. They published a series of bitter accusations and counter-accusations, retrospectively blaming each other for the Confederate defeat. They d- were not on the same page, and that's part of why Beauregard was constantly being moved around because Davis kept firing him. Uh, so there was a lot of recriminations between the two after the war. Beauregard eventually dies in 1893 of a heart attack at the age of 74 in his beloved city of New Orleans. All right. So next is George Thomas. And what we're going to see with Thomas is that hurt feelings and anger between the Union and the Confederacy do not heal by any means after the war concludes, uh, even at the family, even at the family level, for example. So he was a Virginian. uh, But he chose to stay loyal to the Union. So his family disowned him. They turned his picture against the wall. They destroyed his letters and never spoke to him again. And after the economy of the South collapses after the war with emancipation and billions of dollars of capital is suddenly wiped out, uh, Thomas sent some money to his sisters, but they refused to accept it, saying that they had no brother. And then uh, after the end of the Civil War, he held various commands through 1869 During Reconstruction, he acted to protect freedmen from white abuses, and he set up military commissions to enforce labor contracts since local courts had ceased to operate or were biased against newly freed blacks. And he also used troops to protect places threatened by violence from the Ku Klux Klan. In 1869, he was given command of the military district of the Pacific, but he died a year later from a stroke at the age of 53. And even at his funeral, none of his relatives attended, his blood relatives. Oh, that's just awful. I, I hate that's such a sad story. Thomas was such a great general. But I, I mean, I guess it's understandable if you're a dyed in the wool Confederate and your your brother goes and fights for the other side, you, you'd be a little bit upset, a lot upset, maybe. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about now another Confederate. And this is Lee's old war horse, one of the most able Confederate Corps commanders, James Longstreet. And Longstreet, I might add, is kind of the hero of the book, The Killer Angels, and the movie Gettysburg that we talked about earlier. Longstreet 
It's a very interesting story. He settled in New Orleans after the war, and he worked in the railroad cotton and insurance businesses. Surprise, surprise. But unlike a lot of these other generals, he became a pariah in the South for several reasons. First of all, he converted to Catholicism, which was <laughs> very, very frowned upon, especially in the South. Not in the North so much, but in the South. The South was heavily Protestant. Uh, and then he joined the Republican Party, which was even worse in the eyes of most Southerners. <laughs> Yeah. Catholic, okay, that's just weird. Pro Republican, that's of the devil. Um, and then he served in the Grant administration. He and Grant had been friends before the war. In fact, Longstreet was the best man in General Grant's wedding. Isn't that interesting? Hmm. Of course, he wasn't General Grant at the time. This was when he was a young man, but more like Captain or Lieutenant Grant. But So they had been friends. And so... Uh, Grant, when he becomes president, appoints Longstreet as minister to Turkey. Your oh, favorite very country. nice. Yeah. Yeah, how about that? So um, there's a connection with Scott. And maybe, I don't know, maybe the worst sin of all that Longstreet committed was he publicly criticized Lee's strategy at Gettysburg. Okay, so, <laughs> all right. So think of, in the eyes of the South, you convert to Catholicism, that's not good. Join the Republican Party. That's awful. Serve in the Grant administration. That's bad. But you criticize Robert E. Lee. That is the worst sin you can possibly commit. Remember, we talked earlier about how Lee was raised to the level of sainthood in Southern eyes. Lee could do no wrong. And and yet uh, Longstreet goes on record as saying, well, maybe we shouldn't have attacked on that third day. We shouldn't have done Pickett's charge. We should have done what I said. We should have redeployed to a more defensible position. But that is a cardinal sin. You, you don't criticize Robert E. Lee, at least not in the late 1800s. Uh, Longstreet later moves to Georgia, and he dies in 1904. He lives a pretty long time, despite his war wounds at the age of 82. Longstreet becomes the villain of the Confederacy in the Lost Cause writings. Since the late 20th century, though, his reputation has risen. And many Civil War historians now consider him among the war's most gifted tactical commanders. I know in the book, The Killer Angels, I mean, obviously that's a novel. It's a work of fiction, but but it's, it has a lot of good historical insights. And the author of that, Michael Shera, really presents Longstreet as the future of warfare, a, a forward-looking general who understood that you don't order frontal assaults against fortified positions across wide open fields. Instead, you, you, you try to find your, your own defensive ground, a better position. You force the enemy to fight you on ground of your own choosing. So, yeah, Longstreet probably was quite a bit ahead of his time, but uh, he didn't get any thanks for it in the South. We'll dive more into the myth of the lost cause. Yeah. Um, I didn't know about the Longstreet element and how he's the villain, so I'll be curious to, to hear your take on that. Uh, so the next person on the Union side is Irving McDowell. He, beginning in 1864, he's rotated through a series of commands, including California, the East, the South, and California again. He retires from the Army, and after his retirement in 1882, he served as Park Commissioner of San Francisco, California. So, hmm. yeah, so he's out there in the West after the gold That's rush. It's not your typical post general job, is it? It's a dusty outpost. I mean, there's the gold rush, but it's not the it's not oh. the beacon uh, that it is today. What he does is, in his capacity, he constructed a park in the neglected reservation of the Presidio. He lays out drives that commanded views of the Golden Gate. So that would come into play later, so an early developer of California, if we want to consider him that. And he dies of gastric cancer on May 4th, 1885, at the age of 66. So I guess he kind of redeems himself. Terrible general, but uh, but did a lot of good things for the San Francisco. Well, I guess we have to talk about your forefather here. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> It's about time, finally. <laughs> I should have put him at the head of the list. No, I'm just <laughs> right above uh, Davis, exactly. Yeah. All right, so Jubal Early, my personal favorite Confederate general. Um, this is, <laughs> if you've been listening to what we've said about Early so far, this will not surprise you. <laughs> I love this so much, Scott. I'm sorry, I can't stop laughing as I look at the notes. True Texan. 
Oh, yeah, and he's not even from Texas, but he should have been. Um, after Lee's surrender, <laughs> Jubal Early refused to give...